numbers, because we're all quite analytical people probably here, but also uh, some case studies, some examples of what other companies are doing that could be instructive in how you might be able to transform. And uh, I, I've been working in the telecoms industry for a long, a long time now, probably like many of you as well. Um, I used to run a think tank called Telco 2.0, uh, which was researching and promoting new business models for the telecoms industry. Because about um, you know, eight years ago, you could see that the, the big growth in the industry was starting to plateau and you know, not growing as fast as it was. And I remember at uh, Mobile World Congress in 2008, so how long that is ago, um, the CEO of Deutsche Telekom said on the stage at the leadership summit, because all the CEOs uh, there, he said, that, he said, we've grown very fast, we're plateauing, we're about to um, uh, get under significant pressure. Um, 2008 is the year of the business model. We need to reinvent it. And if I look uh, eight years on, I see no reinvention of the business model, if I'm completely honest. Um, and we think that the situation of the industry is getting more and more challenging. It's still a very strong and powerful industry, protected in some respects by regulation, of course. Um, but, as Henri said, there is a lot of gold in them bar hills, as people say, and I think there's a new, op a new opportunity for the telecoms industry to really leverage its assets and capabilities to take advantage of that in a new way, with an evolution of the business model. And uh, I'm very pleased that you're here to discuss that, uh, this with us today. We spend, Henri and, and Angus, for, um, and some of the huge amount of time talking to the people in the telecoms industry and have you've got amazing assets and capabilities. And, ever, and when we are, ask enterprises, do you know these guys have got this to help you digitally transform? And they say, oh, they don't tell us about this. They try and sell us limits or connected connections and so on. And we think that it's, uh, they're, they're, they're so latent, the assets and capabilities, they're so relevant for the fourth industrial revolution that it's a shame not to try and really leverage them. So I suppose that's the, that's the broad um, context for our discussion today. And as I said, we'll, we'll, we've got a, I'll share some analysis now. We're going to hear from um, some colleagues who are um, working at the cutting edge of, of this marketplace. And then I'm gonna, we're going to try and make it a, discuss, a discussion with everybody here as well, so to make it as useful and interactive as possible. And I guess the idea is that often people come to events and they think, well, no, I, it, there's just other people who are above me or to the side or whatever who, who need to make these big strategic decisions. What can I do? But I think what we're going to hear, particularly in the panel, is some um, visionary people who've stuck their neck out and made things happen in their company and shown what is the art of the possible to the rest of, the, of, of their colleagues. And I think the more of that we can do, the better. But I think it needs to be guided by some principles and a framework, which I hopefully will try and outline today. So I hope that makes sense with everybody. Um, and so we, um, in terms of trying to start, this is what I, this, this, present, this was the slide I was, <laughs> we had in earlier on. I think it's not what I want to be saying here, because I've already, I've already explained about how the, the telecoms industry is flat this morning. 0.9% um, CAGR worldwide. If you're in Europe, it's, it's probably not so exciting. And uh, that's for the next five years. And this is question mark. So is it going to stay flat? Uh, or is it going to decline? Or is it going to grow? And we think there's the golden opportunity is it for, for it to grow in this market here, uh, the IoT-enabled services market. IT is here. We're, we're moving into IT. We, we do that already. and very pretty good at that. But this is the opportunity, because every type of service uh, in, that, in that sector, or that emerging sector, needs to be orchestrated and monetized. And which industry is the best at orchestrating and monetizing complex services in tiny amounts and chunks? Yes, that can go. Telecoms industry. That's what we've, we've been brilliant at that. So every second of usage gets, gets charged. And all these industries who are trying to create complex services will need those capabilities. So our suggestion is, why don't we, as well as the connectivity that we offer and the, the IT capability, why don't we make available our other assets and capabilities uh, that we have to this fast emerging market? Rather than necessarily, as Henri said, rather than trying to find the gold ourselves, which we can continue doing, why not sell the picks and shovels 
but sell the picks and shovels where people will pay a premium for, not just the connectivity picks and shovels. So that's the, the principle I'm, we're going to uh, uh, was going to start with. And um, our analysis has shown that this, it's about $8 trillion there worldwide, um, breaks down uh, roughly like this. I'm going to break it down to another layer as well in a second. But interestingly enough, 70% uh, of it is B2B. So of $8 trillion, 70% is B2B and what we might call B2B to X, to the, to, um, B2B to C or B2B to things. Um, and that's a, that's, quite a, that's a good thing because because businesses, enterprises, um, will pay a premium for the types of assets that, that telcos have. The consumer world, there tends to be other people who can serve them probably better than us. We, we never came up with WeChat. We're still struggling with RCS, if anybody knows what that is. Um, people have moved way beyond us. But in the B2B world, you need trusted networks, you need to be able to monetize things, um, and that security is very important, particularly in IoT, and, and that, that's a real big heritage of the telco industry, that, that trust, the fact that it's regulated, and that we do like not just five nines, but 12 nines in terms of reliability. So let's so, so maybe build on that rather than other things. And um, this market manufacturing sector, well, what, what could we offer the manufacturing sector that we don't do today? But that's about 33%, enormous uh, amount of new economic opportunity there. So what, what I'm going to do is try and break this down a little bit, and then I'm going to um, uh, talk through a case study about Amazon. And we heard about Amazon earlier on, who seemed to be break, the most disruptive company in the world, keep on growing and so on. But they did it in a very interesting way, which I think has direct analogies to the telecoms industry. So we're going to try and look at that in detail, and then we'll end up by, think, by, by talking about well, what could we do, how could we learn from this, and apply some of the platform thinking that Jeff talked about this morning to our business. Um, so let's just try and break this down. Again, I, we, we, we did this uh, report, which you've got, got on your um, chairs here, uh, and it says boosting IoT revenues by up to 500%, uh, the opportunity for the telecoms industry. And I thought that would grab attention. 510 sounds quite an attractive uh, growth, growth thing. Um, but what we've tried to do is to understand where that eight trillion breaks down. And we've, we've split it down into various um, aspects here. And tomorrow in the IoT session, we'll go into another level of detail. But these are things you know, you know, you know well about, things like personal wellness services or um, energy monitoring in the workplace or let's take uh, adaptive traffic management, all the things that you talk about with the R&D department, IT department day, day in, day out. Um, but the key thing, of course, is to recognize that most of the money is in the application itself of a typical IoT service. Most of the money is in the application. About 5% is the, the connectivity. And this interesting layer here, the 15%, is what we might call the enabling services, the OSS or BSS, or what you often partner with people like um, Thingworks or Ericsson DCP, those sort of companies who provide the ability um, for things to, to manage the connections between things. But most of the money's here. Now, logical or traditional thinking would be to say, well, why don't we, this is a big addressment, why don't we create applications? So why don't we be the gold uh, diggers? But, I, but our, our premise is that rather than doing that, and uh, like Amazon, rather than us invent things, why don't we let, enable other people to invent things using our platform and our enabling capabilities? Could that be a, a better way, a, a new way to grow? So that's our, that's our premise there. Now, another way of looking at this is the spend uh, within a household. So if you take just one of those sectors in that, in that pie chart, let's take the home. If you remember, that was the smallest bit of the pie chart. It's still, you know, still a, you know, a very, very sizable amount. If you just take household expenditure, this is from, this is from Germany could be any, any country in Germany. Currently, we play in this little slice here. This is postal communication and telecoms. But most people spend uh, lots of money on other things. And at the moment, we take virtually none of that. And I just wonder, given the brand, the fact that you have the pipe in everybody's house, you have the ability to pay for things, um, if you were Amazon or Apple or Alibaba or Uber or whatever, you'd say, well, I've got an enormous number of customers here. 
I've got a platform for engaging with them. They pay me money already. Who else would be interested in that? And I just wonder why we can't, particularly in the IoT world, start to take more of the, the, the household spend expenditure, the share of wallet, by enabling other people to create IoT-based services that cut across these different sectors uh, with different capabilities. So rather than just sell the traditional stuff, why not let other people invent and sell things through you into the home? And that would be called, people talk about quad play today, which is pretty good because the more you bundle things up, you know from all this, the, the experience you have, people stay sticky, they, pay, they, they, um, they stay loyal and they pay you more money. But why not more? So maybe it's X play. But to do that, you have to think rather differently. You have to think, what is our role? Our role is not to provide the applications or indeed necessarily to do a, a reseller arrangement. That would be retail. But maybe it's to be a platform which is enabling other people, going back to the principles that Jeff talked about this, mo uh, this morning. So we think there's a, even in the home, which is the smallest sliver of that, uh, that pie, there's an opportunity to take more of the share of spend if we really, uh, if we can do it in a different way. And to try and bring that to life, I, was, I thought I'd show you this case study from Amazon and really drill down on how they operate and why they're so successful. So 20% CAGR over 10 years, that's not, that's not bad, you know, compared to 0.9% uh, for the telecoms industry. There's all kinds of reasons why they can do it and they're different, they're not regulated, don't know, all that. But let's look at fundamentally uh, what they do and what of that could we apply? Not everything, of course. So now the interesting thing, of course, is that their, their, their market capitalization has now overtaken Walmart, which is a significantly bigger company. And I think that part of the reason for that, as Jeff said earlier on, is that is their AP, well, part of the reason, not only do they have the platform strategy and business model, but they have opened up with their APIs to enormous extent, way beyond uh, Amazon, as we know. And I, I, did a, I asked a question of um, one company recently, a big, big, com big uh, telco company, how many APIs do you expose? And it was a fraction of what uh, Amazon does. Now, if we just look at um, the evolution of their share price, this is 1997 and that's 2016. And we just um, looked at the last uh, 10 years. If you'd in, uh, invested $1,000 in Amazon, you'd have 160000 today. So I, I'm kicking myself. Why didn't I put $1,000 into Amazon there? Um, so that's not bad. Did anybody do that? Did anybody put some money in 10 years ago? No. Bit of a shame. Anyway, but what, what, Amazon, what Amazon did here, it grew really fast in the dot-com bubble, and it started to decline. And in 2000, it said, they, and I'll describe this in a moment, they said, well, how on earth are we going to grow again? Because we grew really fast, and then, we, then we're declining. Our, we're taking on lots of inventory. Uh, we can't sell it quick enough. Um, our shareholders are not buying our story anymore. What do we do? And that's when they ca had the epiphany moment of saying, rather than try and do everything ourselves, which is what every incumbent organization does, including every telco today, as far as I can see, Let's let other people use our platform. And they created the marketplace with a lot of uh, tension internally about doing that, where buyers of uh, different categories, Amazon, were saying, well, why are you inviting my competitors to provide services to, thr through us? But they decided, we're going to open up our platform. And, well, I'll explain why in a second. And then they said, well, let's leverage our infrastructure even more. And they created Amazon Web Services. So we spent all this money on IT. Why not let other people use it? And then they said, well, let's then sell services to our merchant uh, customers in the marketplace. So enabling services. They created the fulfillment services. And then they said, let's create some loyalty scheme uh, for our customers. I, in fact, I, I haven't seen any loyalty scheme with, with a tel with my, as, a, as a telco customer. I have no loyalty scheme at all I've ever come across. Um, and then they, then they said, well, let's create... Um, some consumer electronic devices, that means more of our stuff can go on there than they've invested in studios, their own content, applications, their own streaming service, they bought into a gaming company, and then they have the Echo, which is the voice recognition device that you speak to in your, in your home, and it does things for you. 
Um, as I mentioned earlier on, they've, spent 100, they've uh, invested $100 million in, in a training fund for developers to use Echo. That's a big investment in that. Um, so that's what they've, they've uh, done, and I'm going to explain why. And Jeff Bezos said seven years ago, sorry, um, nine years ago, he said, it takes five to seven years before we have a meaningful impact. And part of the issue in the telecoms industry, we've had all these ideas, every single one of these ideas, way back here. But we've never had the patience to, to, to let them develop. But critically, we've neither had the business model framework in which they could survive and thrive. So we've always seen it like a linear type of business where we create something, we try and sell it. Damn, it's not quite earning as much as the McKinsey forecast said it would do, so we'll can it. We've never taken this time to let it grow, but critically, we haven't had the framework in which it can grow, and I'm gonna show you the framework in a minute. So I, I give one example. Um, one of my uh, friends used to be um, the global commercial strategy director at Vodafone Group. He reported to, I think he reported to Vittorio Calao, or whoever, um, and he said, in their board meetings, they had seven minutes to discuss mobile advertising. Seven minutes to discuss mobile advertising, the role, what Vodafone were going to do. Now, if that is your level of commitment to a platform business model, it's unlikely to really uh, thrive. So, let's come back to Amazon. So, so fine, it's a lot of invention and so on, but what holds it all together? Um, I'm going to show you... There are three types of their business, and I'm going to show you um, how it all fits together. So they started out as a retailer or reseller, and in the telecoms industry, we do retail and reselling, of course. So they buy goods, and they sell them, and they make a margin. That's the business model there. The second thing they do is they are a product business. So they, they, they um, if you like, buy inputs, and they create outputs, and they sell a product. Telecoms industry, we do the same, create a product. But the third thing they've added on is the platform. And the platform is about acquiring and matching people, as we heard earlier on. So it's getting out of the way, but facilitating interactions. And if you get that right and get the network effects working, then you can take off. So they, they added that to their business. And indeed, in terms of the different types of things they do, you can categorize them in, in different areas here. So their retail business is a retail. Their, let's see here, their, their cloud services, Amazon Web Services, is in fact a product business. They, they, they take inputs, they, they offer an IT service. However, the Amazon Web Services marketplace for applications on there is a platform. Their software is a platform, their devices are a product, their on-demand video is a, is a retailer and reseller, and they, they, they've just bought this um, gaming platform called Twitch, um, which is a platform. So, how do you bring these together? And that's, and that's the key question. Because in telco, we have lots of this. We have lots of that. We do have a bit of that at, at, uh, in reality. But we haven't integrated them. And as a result, it doesn't cr the 1 plus 1 doesn't equal 3. It, it actually equals lots of silos. So this is the, this is the, the thing that holds it all together. And it's... Um, it's known as the uh, Jeff Bezos napkin, because back in 2000, when they weren't growing, apparently they were in a cafe and they, they wanted to work out how they're gonna grow again, and someone drew it on a napkin. It's probably made up, but I'll show it to you anyway here. Um, but at this, this is all about customer centricity, and that's the key thing. People often, oh, we, we, we at Telco, we're all about customer experience and customer centricity. This is real customer centricity. Let me show, try and explain it. They said, what do our customers want? They want selection. They, would, they want a choice of as many things as possible, not just what we're capable of giving them. And they said, if they do that, then they're happy, they come back. Who else is interested in lots of traffic? Third party sellers. And if we could attract them, then we're delivering what customers want, which is selection. So if you come back to the home example, the digital home, the share of wallet, we we offer, in the telecoms industry, a very small set of, uh, of um, options for people to choose from. Customer experience is okay on those. We, get, we have some traffic, but we have nobody else providing stuff. It's all over the top, as we know, and we moan about over the top. 
And why do we moan about it over the top? Because we haven't actually ever provided any opportunity to uh, embrace over the top and, and monetize it. So the great thing about this, this is the map napkin here, is that they said that if other people are using our infrastructure, then it lowers our overall cost, because other people are paying for it. That then leads to lower prices, and that leads to customer experience. That, it, that is customer centricity, but it's not doing everything yourself for the customer. Now, the really interesting thing was, that was their original uh, growth flywheel. But what's happened next? They do skate to where the puck is going. They are masters of, of that, as you know. They've now thought, well, how can, we, how can we enhance the customer experience? Let's create some connected devices, and let's create some new access points as well, so devices and, and content. So what they've now done, they've created another flywheel. So they've created, using their infrastructure, Amazon Web Services, they've created a, an IoT developer toolkit. They started, I think, 12 months ago, and they have 227 open source projects on that as of today, I believe. So 12 months, 227 open source projects, not, not, not you know, pointless applications. If they create their own I, I, on AWS developer tool, they get more third-party IoT devices on their infrastructure. They get con more consumption of that infrastructure. They get more scale. They get lower cost. And, and so it goes. And so they move into the IoT world to create a new fly flywheel that comes back through this to support this one. And that is applying platform thinking and adding it to your retail and to your product business. So. So, some, people, um, some people say, well, yeah, we try, the telecoms industry, we've tried all this stuff before. We did mobile advertising. We, we tried to do the wholesale applications community. We've tried um, mobile payments. Yes, of course. Everything has been tried because the telecoms industry is brilliant at, because it's engineering of, of being what we might call fashionistas, trying all the latest things. The telecoms industry invented social networks 20 years ago and everything that exists today but it never managed to put it within a coherent framework. Um, and so we tried all these things, but we didn't have it as part of a coherent business model. And that's, our, that's been our, our challenge, because the business model's been so successful up till now. So it, it's not too late to add the platform capability to the existing capability. And I've got a couple of examples from some other sectors. So in the, in the product sector, a hotel, this is all very recent, so I, I share some, um, some, some thoughts here with you. Uh, Arcor, Arcor, which is a big hotel chain, runs Sofitel and uh, Mercure and all kinds of hotels around the world. It was, it, it was approached by Airbnb to invest in it um, some years ago, and they said, no, we, that, that sounds quite competitive. So they didn't do that. Um, and now they've realized that 2016... Uh, my God, we're now being under significant threat. So they've now opened up their, their capability, their reservation platform, to third parties. So now they are creating a long tail of rooms that they can be in the center of, of facilitating. So they're starting to come back. And indeed, they've made an acquisition of a company that's similar to Airbnb, but for premium um, uh, rentals. And then they're looking to roll that out. So that's a traditional company who's now understood they can't just be a product business, that they need to get into this market, and they've made some sensible decisions about how to do that. Another is Darty, the, the retailer in France, the electronics retailer in France, who you may know, and they added a marketplace. For them, it was just a, a third-party marketplace to their retail business, and what they found are these types of um, benefits just from doing that in the last year or so. In terms of margins, they're generating bigger margins from things that are sold through their marketplace than they sell themselves. In terms of having increasing the number of stockkeeping units that are available, the selection and choice, it's significantly higher. And what they've, what they've done to start off with is rather than ha inviting p uh, companies that are too close to their uh, categories, they get, they're, they're, they've invited third parties who are a little bit distant to, to start with. So these are tradi very traditional businesses, product and retail, who are embracing this same model. And, and Jeff talked about some other examples before. And I think this, this quote from the Accor um, CEO is quite instructive here. He said, for 15 years we've been sleeping. We've missed the waves of the digital revolution. The first wave was 12 years ago. We didn't move. That, that's, that's almost the reverse of telco. Telco would be, we've been inventing everything for the last 15 years. 
in our R&D department, we've tried things, but we haven't got a coherent business model in which to fit it within. That's how I'd describe it there. So, coming back, I'm just going to wrap up now. Um, we think there is this new type of, of CSP uh, platform, so it could be a telco, could be a media company, could be a technology company, um, which, as Henri said, is suitable for the fourth industrial revolution. And we think the potential is to really put the telco or the service provider at the heart of the local digital economy. So rather than being the, the, the leading provider of integrated communication services, which is often the way we describe ourselves, we are the innovation platform for the, I put in Irish, could be any country there, uh, digital economy. That's what we're going to be. And that's coming back to Ray's point about having a different brand promise. And how it, how it works is, uh, as we described before, is that we've got this incredible capability for secure cloud-based um, communication. And we also have uh, the ability to orchestrate and monetize ser complex services. And every other sector, well, nearly every other sector of the world is looking at how they digitally transform and how they create complex new IoT-based services or experiences and outcomes. And they don't have, unless they go to SAP or Accenture, who build some big system for them, they don't have a platform as a service that they could, they could leverage. Not platform in terms of IT or network, but business platform that helps them, third-party companies, manage their business as they digitally transform and create new services. So as a telco, we use this platform, which integrates the legacy IT, as we mentioned before, for our own operations. This helps us to innovate, to, to cut across the silos that we've set up between our different divisions. We can now do that, whereas before, technologically, it was a bit of a challenge. But then we start to attract other people to provide their innovations, which we could make available to our customers, take more of the share of wallet uh, of our, our customers we already have. But if we're really clever, we can start to have other companies working on our, on our platform to serve their customers as well. And we're going to hear some case studies. Um, in in the, the other rooms, you're, there are case studies going on about how this is being applied in the smart city, the finance, and the um, uh, automotive sector. Um, but we'll hear some more case studies later on about uh, in, in this sector as well. So the, the opportunity is not only to have individual companies working on your platform using that, but also to have whole clusters of organizations who themselves need an infrastructure to run their own ecosystems. So that's the big, I suppose, that's the big opportunity. And really, um, there's nothing to hold us back from doing that, apart from it being not the business model we have today, and not the metrics we have today, and not the operate the organizational structure we have today. So that all sounds great. Um, with the um, new types of technology, and we'll show you some use cases in more detail outside here and tomorrow and, and so on, but the capability is that you can ingest, as we mentioned, whereas Apple sells, or sorry, Amazon helps to facilitate a marketplace of products, complex services are more difficult. You have the what some people call the BSS layer that can, uh, that is already being used for your own products, that's extremely valuable for other companies who don't have that capability. Um, be able to uh, offer any type of consumption or mon monetization model, and then to allow, as we mentioned this morning, the tenants or the users on here to interoperate, to be able to, if I'm an insurance company, I want to bundle up some uh, communication services or some IoT services or something else, create a new proposition and take it to market. And again, if you have some time to have a look at the MK Smart Smart City presentation uh, demo out there, you can see how it's being applied. So that, that is now uh, physically possible when it, where it was in the past quite complex to do. Um, and I suppose our, our, our lesson overall, and this is what we'd like to have a discussion with you about, is this. Um, in, me in many ways, we're talking about linking the, let's call it, in this case, let's take the IoT service delivery chain. This could be your, your network of partners. Let's just take IoT as an example here. You know, all your AEPs and DCPs, your home solution, wellness solution, industrial solution. You've got your network down here. You've got your go-to-market partners, SIs, etc. Those are all the people you're gathering in complex charts of logos about your, who are in your ecosystem. And then you're creating 
mechanisms for, to, for delivering the service, but linking to that is this platform whereby all these participants, internal participants and external participants, are using the same capability to create services and monetize them to create new types of innovation. We've done some um, sizing of this, and this is a, we might come back to this later on, but for one company in Germany, where we said, look, this is your current trajectory for connectivity, but there is a market for service enablers, partnering with IoT applications, potentially creating your own applications once you understand the market better. And then at the top is what um, people, Ray was talking about, enabling business outcomes, where you're getting paid in a very different way for just providing um, services. So, just to finish off here, um, how, do we, um, how do we need to consider this? Um, we do need uh, this uh, exec education, because most of the execs are paid for a very different business model, so nothing will change unless um, an exec wants to really be quite um, bold in moving forward. Um, shareholders are not used to this type of business model either. Um, to help with that, we think this, the notion of let's call it ecosystem reconception, and I'll explain what this diagram is in a second, thinking differently about where we can play as a platform to facilitate what type of interactions between whom is the key thing. So if we don't have this reconception, we don't map it out, spend the time to look at the as-is and the potential options for 2B, then it makes it very int intangible for the, for the board up here. Once you've done this type of analysis, then you can show at least theoretically, how, how something could work and the potential uh, benefits to the company. Uh, this, this, is a, this is Apple's, how Apple reconceived their platform, complementary providers, suppliers, and flows of, of value, but come back to that later on. But the key thing is this, because that's all very, you know, that's all very, you know, that's like a consulting company uh, trying to help uh, people with how they move forward. But this is probably the most important thing what we've, that we've learned with our clients and many of you today is that you need to show the value of something with some what, ninja IT that can get up something up and running very quickly, demonstrate the value, um, and do it in a very different way than a normal traditional project. And that makes it tangible as you, as you describe these other aspects here. So with that in mind, I want to say thank you, uh, thank you for listening to this. And I'm going to ask you now, if I may, well, I think what I'll do is I'll just see if there's any questions of clarity and then I'm going to ask you to discuss what, we've just, what I've just shown here. So is there any, any questions of clarity uh, about what I've just showed here? Yes. So one of, the, um, one of the interesting points you made there and one of the key steps, as I saw it, was their lower cost structure that they were able to generate through opening up um, uh, to third party, opening up their, uh, their, their, uh, to third parties, uh, their business model. Um, I just wonder if you could explain that a little bit further because that would obviously be key for us, say, for example, in telecoms. And one of the ways, if I'm reading you right, that we can exponentially grow our business is if we open up our, our to third parties um, to help us to identify new growth opportunities. But you're saying that Amazon were able to achieve that and uh, bring in lower prices through a lower cost structure. How did they achieve that and how could telecoms do that? Because in my mind, I just see the bills mounting up <laughs> and the, uh, the, the, the cost mounting well, up I think when the you point, start bringing the, point, sorry, the fundamental point is other people are paying to use your infrastructure that you've paid for. At the moment, you, just, you pay for it and you use it just for yourself. So if you make it available to someone else, then they are paying, they're sure, contributing so you're not actually that. lowering your cost, but you're getting, uh, well, spreading well, it. Well, you're lowering your, ultimately you are then for providing the total service, your, your costs are going down, which means you can then reduce prices for, for, your, for your core business as well. Okay. Okay. I mean that, that's, that's ultimate, you know, the economics of how it <coughs> fits together. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any other questions, just, just clarity, then I'm gonna ask you to sort of discuss a bit. Any, any other things? Yeah, yes, yes, I think. You've spoken quite a lot about the, uh, the future mode of operation, as I would see it. Um, we don't have anything like this at the moment. Wondering uh, the sort of time frames that you're typically seeing for other, for other telcos and service providers. How long does it take to get to this target state? Because I'm very impatient, but, you know, time, cost, quality, that yeah. sort of thing. 
Well, I think, I think we're going to hear a bit about that on the panel with some of the people we're working with who will sort of talk about their practical experiences. But of course, if you boil the ocean, if you create a sort of massive strategy, it'd take forever to do it. And I think this is that last point I was trying to say there is about you, you don't really need to you don't need to wait for the IT department to help you to, to get you to do something. You can get going very fast. And we'll hear some really interesting case studies on a quad play, which was done in sort of record time. We'll hear about some other examples later on. So it's not, um, you know, if you, were if, you were to, if you were driving it from the top, um, that's one thing. Unlikely, that's difficult to coordinate, and if you, ha you need a visionary leader to do that, and you have shareholders who will support that which is quite difficult for in these types of, of businesses. Um, but you can show real quick advantage um, in certain aspects of the business by applying this. So the, I don't know if you remember the quote, actually we'll hear from um, Maria from BT actually about how uh, they're generating sort of quite significant growth in one part of the business which is adopting this model. So it doesn't have to be a big bang boil the ocean, but I think you want to have, I think the, the difficulty I, I would say, uh, and in many ways, it's such a fundamental shift to say we're going to become a platform as a business. It's, it's too exposing for the people at the top of the business. But in fact, you, know, you can get going with something pretty fast in a certain area, show real value, but you do need, this is the bit about the executive education, you do need the framework in which you're allowed to do that. Otherwise, it's just seen as an ordinary, pro uh, just another project. It doesn't get the funding it's, it deserves. And the, the execs are in their day-to-day -day business and you know, they're too busy to, to listen. So there is a need to, to go both ends, I, I would say, I, I colleagues probably agree with, is that there is the need to, while you're engaging, not, not you know, you're engaging the, the senior people, showing some real practical things and then, that, and then try and bring the two together, I would say. Yeah, m m maybe also uh, I would add that uh, with many uh, of our telco clients, we face uh, time to market constraints and um, what we see is that usually when we, we have clients who want to set up and start a new platform, monetizing platform, uh, historically they would say, okay, I need a new BSS, so let's see together in three years' time and maybe there's a 50% chance that we will fail and maybe 50% chance that we will deliver something. This is the history of BSS, more or less. Carl, do you agree with that? <laughs> so now we think that the next evolution or next generation of, uh, of uh, uh, BSS related technology should be much more, much more agile, much more rapid to implement, ninja IT, as you said. So it means that we should never enter into a project that will exceed one year. So it's quite a chance. So it means that we have to go for agile methodology, we have to go for scrum teams, we have to target minimum viable product so that we can start working and generating revenue within the first six months of the project, which is a huge change compared to classic BSS implementation. This is a time frame that we need to, to, to manage to sort out the time to market constraints because if we say that in three years time we are able to help clients in the B2, with B2B customers, it will be nowhere when the, and the much too late in the market. Anybody else, want, uh, yes, just at the back there. Sure. So Andy Hicks from IDC, I'd ask a question in the morning session. Um, we've been talking a lot about making SPs the, the owners of these platforms, right, and making them the center, which of course is sort of the, the sexiest and highest value role to be in. But uh, telcos are members of many different kinds of ecosystems today, and sometimes there's good money in that, right, without being the leader. You, you can open up a messaging API, for example, and a lot of people can use that, and you're selling more messaging, and, and that's great. Is there a tension that you see between enabling other ecosystems as, as not the owner, as sort of a, maybe a peripheral or an enabling player? It, does, that, does that hurt you in, in building your own ecosystem, or can you sort of have the two things evolve together? I think, I think the ideal is to have them evolve together. I mean, like, like, like sort of Amazon has done there. Um, because I mean, you'll hear from some of the stories later on today how some of the other, some of the telcos are doing this at the moment, and it is a, you know, it's a, uh, I guess, uh, a difficult journey to fully see that vision and then and move towards it. But the the assets that the telcos have are so much in demand by other people, but they're just not being made available in a way that's easily consumable and, and usable. 
Um, in, the, in the next door, just there, there's a smart city um, case study from, I, I mentioned it earlier on, from in rural America, where it's a telco, but it's actually BT is providing this um, infrastructure with this capability, I just mentioned exactly that capability, to enable sort of a whole marketplace of services for 40 million people in rural America. So that's a, you know, it could just, it could just have provided the connectivity. It, it does partnerships with the local connectivity provider. It could just do that. That's probably not a bad deal to win. But to be right at the center and providing the service monetization orchestration capabilities puts it in, the much, in a more valuable position there. And it's generating many more opportunities, or more, well, it's a more valuable position and generating more revenue opp opportunities as well. So it needn't, I don't, I don't think there's a, um, there needn't be a tension if it's carefully understood. I think the point is correct though, that um, uh, if it's seen as just another project or another line of business, then it can see, be seen as cannibalizing or infringing on other parts of the business. But if you have that framework, or the organizing framework that uh, describes how things fit together, then I think it, it, I, I think, um, it should be um, clear that it's, it's a possibility, it's, a, it's an appropriate approach. Yeah. Yeah. Um, good, what I think we might do is, uh, before we, we're gonna hear from, in a minute, from Maria from BT about what BT is doing, and then we're gonna hear from John, John is here, John, John, good. John's here, who's gonna share some, uh, he's from Analysis Mason, who's gonna share some, um, some analysis about uh, some aspects of what we just described. But I think just before we do that, to generate a little bit of after lunch energy, I'm gonna ask you to, um, with the people next to you or around you, just to, uh, I'm gonna ask you to do, to ask, um, or discuss with each other uh, the following things. What, from what we've talked about, what do you like about this concept, if you like? What do you like about that? Secondly, what are your issues and concerns? And thirdly, what new ideas have been stimulated by this discussion and your own discussions here? And I can, we'll spend about five minutes doing that. And I think if one of you in your little group might just take a few notes, that will be very useful because I, we might come around and just ask you to feed back some of your comments. So would you be happy, I know it's a bit after lunch, a bit sort of uh, deflated. Would you be happy with a little, little post-lunch uh, exercise like this? Yes. yes, good. So. I think you can self-organize, uh, but I think if you find some interesting people you like the look of, either next to you, ask those three questions. What do you like about what you're hearing? What, do, what issues are concerned? What new ideas? And if one of you would just take, jot a few notes down, afterwards we'll come around and see where we are, and then we'll move on to, uh, to Maria for the next piece. So five minutes on that, over to you.